Malachi chapter 2 talks about a covenant. Covenant that God had made with Israel. And Israel had corrupted this covenant by neglecting it, breaking it, and ultimately despising it. God still mercifully, however, reaches out to them to show them their sins against His covenant. And the word covenant is an agreement. It, has, it comes from two root Hebrew words, which one means to choose judiciously or carefully. And interestingly, a second meaning of the word is to eat moderately. That's an interesting term for a covenant, is it not? Especially for the remnant people. But this is how it implies itself in the spiritual life. First of all, it's an agreement that we choose judiciously. In other words, before we enter into a covenant with God, we count the cost. Because there is a cost. But what is given to us is far greater than any cost. Because it is eternal life. And so we count the cost and we realize, and God makes it very plain to us what this covenant is, what its stipulations are, what its details are, so we can understand it. And it also means to eat moderately. What does that mean? Well, it means to commune with one another, because every time two generals would make peace in the old days of war, they would eat together. They would spend time communing together. And the feast that we enjoy with Jesus is a feast that He gives us of spiritual things when we open the door of our heart and we let Him in and He sups with us and we sup with Him. It is that beautiful, holy impartation and eating of the food of God that He wants to give us through His Word. We also have a covenant with God through Jesus Christ today and personally as a people. Are we treating this precious, powerful, and blood-bought covenant the same way Israel of old did? In Malachi's day? Let's see if we are and how we can make amends today. Malachi chapter 2 and beginning in verse 1. The Word of God says, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. And as I mentioned before, priests here, physically the priests that were serving in the temple, but spiritually we are all priests in one sense. So this commandment is for all of us. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Did you notice? The same term is used in one verse, and that term is lay it to heart. And what does that mean? You haven't taken to heart what I'm telling you. You may have taken it to mind, intellectually, you may have taken it in your mind informationally, but it has not made a transformation in your life. It has not entered in, and you have not laid what I have told you, God says, to your heart. And what is His commandment? He says, the commandment is for you. What's His commandment? To give glory unto my name. So that whatever we do, and whatever we say, and however we behave, we, we, our, our motto and our mission is always to ask, Will this give glory to Almighty God or not? If it doesn't, then I don't want to do it. I don't want to say it. I don't want to eat it. I don't want to wear it. I don't want to have any part of it. Amen. Give glory to my name, saith the Lord. Lay it to heart. Hear what I'm telling you. And to hear in the Hebrew not only means to hear, but to obey. To glorify God's character. To do it for the glory of God, not for the glory of self. And he says, look, because you haven't done this, if you don't do this, first of all, I'm going to curse your blessings. In fact, he says, I've already cursed them because you have not laid it to heart. What does that mean? How are our blessings cursed today? Well, we know how the blessings of Israel were cursed in those days because the table of the Lord became contemptible. The offerings of the Lord became contemptible and what they offered to God that should have been a blessing now became contemptible to them. But how do God's blessings become curses today? For example, how does the reading and studying and using of the Bible become a curse instead of a blessing? Whenever we read it without the Holy Spirit. Whenever we read it merely to be informed 
not to be changed. And whenever we use it simply to smack somebody over the head with, but not to make a declaration of the Word of God that will effect change by His power. The Bible, the reading and the studying and the using of the Bible can become a curse. In fact, it has become a curse in the remnant church today. You know why? Because we don't believe it's inspired. We don't really believe that it is inspired of God, that every word of God is pure. And I've even heard people say, listen, we're not fundamentalists. We don't believe in inerrancy. Excuse me. The Bible says that all Scripture is inspired of God. It doesn't say some. It doesn't say a little bit. It doesn't say part of it. It says all. And all, last I checked, means all. Everything is inspired. And so everything is beneficial to us. But what do we do with the Bible? We pick and choose what we want to learn, what we want to read, and we stay stagnated in a few places, but we don't realize that all the Bible has something to teach us. Even the chronologies, even the genealogies. They have spiritual lessons for us to learn. But we don't believe it. So we don't read the Bible in earnest expectation, expecting that God is going to speak to us. And not only that He's going to speak to us, but that He's going to change our lives. And not only that He's going to change our lives, but if we speak the Word of God with power, He will change other people's lives also. The story is told of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was testing out his sound system in his church. And in those days, the sound systems were kind of like a little bowl on the top. They had no microphones, no electricity. So your voice would ricochet off the top and it would spread out. And as he was testing the sound system, he decided to test it by quoting a scripture. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world, he said in his princely stentorian voice. But he didn't realize there was somebody in the church. Somebody was fixing the roof on top of the church. And when that man heard that scripture, it hit him like a ton of bricks. Spurgeon didn't realize it. The man heard that scripture and he started to wrestle with the concept of the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. And it so impacted him that he he dropped his tools, he ran home, he got on his knees, and he got converted. Power of the Word of God. Don't you think that Word has the same power today? That if we declare it and we give it and we teach it, that it can change lives? The spirit of prophecy, the reading and the studying of the spirit of prophecy has become cursed to us today because we don't lay it to heart. We don't read it for ourselves. We read it for somebody else. We say, brother so-and-so needs to see this statement. But we don't realize the statement is for me first. And when it's done a work in my heart first, then I can go to brother so-and-so prayerfully if God calls me to do that. And then I can explain it to him and tell him in love what he needs to do. Spirit of prophecy has become an arsenal, an artillery, a a machine gun magazine that we load and we shoot whenever we want to prove a point. But we don't actually read the spirit of prophecy to gain spiritual strength and to gain a further and more fervent love of the word of God. And so as a result, it has no effect. What else is cursed? What other blessing is cursed? Our churches are cursed instead of blessed. Why? Because we're allowing worldliness in. We're allowing powerlessness in. We're allowing lovelessness in. We're allowing gossiping in. We're allowing the things that are unholy in the church. And so the church, instead of becoming a witness of called out ones, is now a group of called in ones. We're back in the world. And the world is in the church. And how can the church be a witness if we're not out of the world? Our educational systems have become cursed. What once started as something that would teach the people the the, the basics, the fundamentals of the faith, the truths of God that have been revealed to this church are now being challenged by those institutions. And they're using higher criticism and they're saying, oh, some of the Bible is inspired, some of the Bible is not inspired. And they're saying, oh, you know, Ellen White wasn't a theologian. And I confronted a professor one time when he said that. And I said to him, sir, what is more important, thus saith the Greek or thus saith the Lord? And he says, well, thus saith the Lord, of course. I said, well, then, she doesn't have to be a theologian. She's a prophet, and when she says, thus saith the Lord, that's good enough for me. Isn't it? 
That's good enough. But we've cursed the blessings that God gives us because now people are even challenging what we're doing here. When you turn line upon line, precept upon precept, they're calling it the proof text method. And they're saying you shouldn't use the proof text method to prove a doctrine. That's how our pioneers found it. That's how God revealed it to them. That's good enough for me. But we're challenging that. People are challenging that in our institutions. And instead, we're not teaching and instructing one another in the faith like our pioneers did. But instead, we're going away from it. And we're producing intellectual atheists who don't really believe in God. And that's why the fodder that you get from the pulpit nowadays is so shallow, so one-dimensional, that it has no transformative power because it is not based on the word of the living God. Listen to some of our pioneers speaking, and I'm talking about like presidents of conferences back in the day. Listen to J.S. J. Washburn in 1934. Many weary years have we waited for the fullness of power for the outpouring of the latter rain. We can only say with sorrow that there must be some fatal hindrance holding back or restraining the fullness of the Holy Spirit promised by the Lord to His people in due today. 1934. 1935, Elder Watson, president of the General Conference, wrote, There is setting in on this people a tide of worldliness to which we are surrendering. I do not mean to imply that we are not resisting these influences at all, but I believe that the measure of resistance that we are putting forth is not holding us. We are gradually being swept backward and should be alarmed about it. Our resistance of worldly influences is seriously diminishing. I am troubled by the direction that our educational and training work is definitely taking. I'm concerned by the more and more obvious fact that in the education and training of our workers, we are inquiring more of the world and less of God than formerly. I am grieved because we are allowing the erroneous belief that the highest in standards is reached by the ways of the world rather than by the ways of God. 1947. Sad to say, the Reformation fails to take place. 1950, W.H. Branson, we are not so faithful and zealous for God and the truth as we once were, and the end of the world is just upon us. We need that revival now. It is the greatest of our needs. Are we going to let it go on? Are we just going to let it go on? Are we going to go generation after generation saying the same thing, uh, having the same lamentation? Or are we going to get on our knees and make a difference for God in this world at this time in earth's history when we most need to make it? That's the question we have to ask ourselves as we look at these things. Because these are the years that we all look back on fondly and say, oh, it was so great back then. No, they were begging for revival and they were seeing the enemy coming in subtly at that time, slowly. They were warning against it and nobody listened. And here's where we are today. And if we don't listen right now, we're in dire danger for the future. And I believe we're in a more serious danger for the future if we don't listen now. And he says in Malachi chapter 2, Behold, verse 3, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. Wow. I will corrupt your seed. I will corrupt your children, if you don't follow my ways in your home, in your family, in your lifestyle, in your witness, your children will become corrupted. And God says, I will corrupt them. That's pretty serious, isn't it? That's a judgment. So when we're looking at the church today and we're seeing the things that are happening with our young people leaving the church, going into worldliness, that is a judgment of God upon us because we have not followed His way. And that's not said to discourage you or ruin your beautiful day. That's said to awaken you to the reality of what's going on because the Bible world is the real world. Not the world that you see around you, not the world that people are trying to show you out there. The Bible world is the real world. And the more you get into this book, the more you realize what's happening is a judgment from God. Because He wants us to wake up. 
He wants us to wake up and shake ourselves of our lethargy. It says in Judges 2, 9 to 13 that, that the next generation that came up after Joshua, they didn't know the Lord, so they went into idolatry. The, do our young people know the Lord? Well, we have to get to know Him. And then we can tell them how to get to know Him. Then they will want to get to know Him. And they will not be corrupted. He says, I'm going to spread dung on your faces, on your feasts. I'm going to shame you, in other words. When you get together to worship me, you're going to be ashamed, he says. Why? Because we haven't given him what he requires. And what does he require? Spirit of Prophecy tells us in Southern Watchman, January 17, 1905, it says, The Lord requires of all who profess to be his people far more than they give him. He expects believers in Christ Jesus to reveal to the world in word and deed the Christianity that was exemplified in the life and character of the Redeemer. If the Word of God is enshrined in their hearts, they will give a practical demonstration of the power and purity of the Gospel. Leonard Ravenhill once said, the world is not looking for a new definition of the Gospel. The world is looking for a new demonstration of the Gospel. We're trying to define the gospel. We're trying to redefine the gospel. We're trying to tell people what it is and the accoutrements. The world is not looking for that. First they want to see a demonstration. Then they will want to hear the teaching. We put the cart before the horse. Figure if we teach, then they'll get to know and they'll get excited about it. And all. Wait a minute. They need to see it demonstrated. They need to see it in the life of the people. And God can do it if we will only Surrender ourselves to Him. So first we have the reaping of the continual breaking of the covenant and we see where we are. But now we want to learn about the reason for the compassionate bestowal of the covenant. Look at this in verse... Um, he says first of all in verse 4, You shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. So you'll, you will know when these things happen... You, have, you will know that you need to start glorifying my name when you see these things taking place among yourselves in Israel. The cursing of your blessing. But he says, now notice this, verse 5. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. My covenant was a covenant of life and peace. Look at Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5 for a moment. <coughs> Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5. So this is where we are. What do we need to realize? We need to realize the glorious bestowal and the purpose of the covenant. Leviticus 18 verse 5. What does it say there? Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall what? Live in them. Now, that's a very important phrase. Live in them. In the atmosphere of holy living, of keeping the commandments, when you decide through my power, because all of God's biddings are enablings. When he commands, he gives the power to do. So when I tell you to do it and you imbibe it by faith and by willingness and by surrender to want to do my will, if a man do it, he shall live in them. You will live in the atmosphere of holiness, of godliness, of goodness, of truth. And you notice he always ends the verse with, I am the Lord. Why? Look at the next verse. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. And he says it many times when he gives a commandment. Why? So they can realize, first of all, that he is God, that he is almighty, that he is all-powerful, and because he is God, we can do it by his power, by his grace, by his strength. I am the Lord. And remember, when you're tempted to do evil, he is the Lord. He is the almighty one. He is the all-powerful one. He is the all-knowing one. Don't disappoint him. Please him. Glorify Him. Take in His power. Go forward. Do what He says. And you will have life. Because there's life in imbibing the Word of God. There's life in surrendering to the Word of the everlasting God. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 22. 
Deuteronomy 11 and verse 22. Notice that God, even in giving them His commandments and telling them what to do, told them the power by which they were to do it, even in the Old Testament. They knew what they had to do. It says in verse 22 of Deuteronomy 11, For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to cleave unto Him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. So here it is. To diligently keep the commandments means to keep them carefully, to keep them passionately, to keep them with effort. Diligently, carefully keep my commandments. And what are these commandments surrounded with? The love of the Lord, to love the Lord your God. Why? We love Him because He first loved us. And that love wherewith He loved us is the same love wherewith we can love Him back. To walk in all His ways, not just to listen to His ways, not just to intellectually memorize His ways, but to actually walk in His ways, which means to live in His ways. That holiness becomes a lifestyle, not merely a theory. And then the last one is the most beautiful one. Cleave unto Him. That means stick to Him. Be inseparable from Him. Pursue Him. Cleave to Him, He says. And that's the whole key. The more you cleave unto Him, the closer you cling to Him, you stick to Him, you pursue Him, He will give you the power now to walk in that atmosphere. And then He says, what's going to happen when you're walking in that atmosphere? Then will the Lord drive out your enemies. Whatever those enemies are. Sin, He'll drive it out. The issues that are plaguing you, He will drive them out or He will make you strong enough to go through the storms of life, no matter what those storms are. No matter what those problems are, you'll have the power to go through. Notice what it says in uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 28. Luke chapter 10 and verse 28. The young, rich young ruler comes to Jesus, asks Him what can he do to inherit eternal life, Jesus tells him what is written in the law. And he quoted some commandments. And then Jesus said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. What did he quote there? It's interesting what he quoted when Jesus asked him what is written in the law. In verse 27 he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He says, so do it. Sorry, not the rich young ruler, the good Samaritan here. The lawyer who asked him, tempted him. What shall I do to inherit eternal life, right? And he says, what's in the law? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he says, thou hast answered right. This do and thou shalt live. Now, (laughs) it should have ended there, right? Give me the strength, Lord, to do it. What does he say? Who is my neighbor? Why? Because he didn't like the Samaritans. He was racist against the Samaritans. So because he was racist against the Samaritans, he said, well, who's my neighbor? Can anybody fit that definition? Or are there some people that may not be my neighbors? And then Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. Switches the roles, as it were. But you see, we say, I want to I wanna do this or I do love the Lord, but then something comes up that shows us that we don't really love Him with all. And then it can be someone that we hate that extinguishes that love. It can be someone that we're struggling with. It can be a sin that we're struggling with, a love that we have that, that supersedes or goes over the love of God. And God is always asking us to examine ourselves. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? That's why he wanted to promise us life. Said that he came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. That's what that life is. That life now causes you to course through your veins. It courses through your veins. And it it allows you now not to be tempted by the thief who comes in to kill and to steal and to destroy. That's why the Apostle Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. What does he say there? That I may know Him. 
But wait a minute, didn't he have a view of Christ on the road to Damascus? Didn't he know Jesus already? But he wanted to know more of him. That I may know him and what? The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The power of his resurrection. The Bible tells us that Jesus was resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit and it is that same power that when we become converted makes us a new creation in Christ. And it's that same power that gives us victory over sin. And it's that same power that gives us the strength that no matter what we're going through, no matter what comes our way, we become conformable to his sufferings. I love the story of the disciples, you know, when they got beaten, unjustly beaten and tried. And they're walking away and they're rejoicing because they were counted worthy to suffer shame in his name. They didn't go back and say, what a, what a travesty, what an injustice. We're going to go call our lawyers. We're going to go call the Human Rights Commission. We're going to take you people to court. No. They rejoiced that they could suffer shame in his name. Because they loved him above all else. So even his shame was more precious to them than their rights. Even his shame. And that's where Christ has to get us that everything about Christ becomes precious to us. Not just the nice things that we want, not just the name it and claim it. Everything, everything, even trials and troubles and tribulations become precious to us. Why? Because we're suffering for His sake. We're not suffering to get anything from Him. We're suffering because we love Him and we stand for the truth and we love His truth and we love His person more than anything else in this world. So we're able to go through it. That's what the covenant was given to us to do, to give us life, that kind of life. The life that can go through anything and still come out swinging for the Lord. In John chapter 14, and then the second word there is peace. John chapter 14, verse 27. John chapter 14 and verse 27. Notice that covenant of peace is still in the New Testament. John chapter 14. And verse 27, Jesus speaking, just finished telling them about the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Did you notice something about that peace there? It's not a peace you can cultivate, it's His peace. He gives you His peace. And He gives it to you so that your heart will not be troubled or be afraid. It says that many people in the last days, their hearts will be failing them for fear at what's coming upon the earth, but not the Christian. The Christian is not living in that kind of fear. The Christian is not troubled by what's coming upon the world. The Christian is troubled because there are people that are lost without Christ. The Christian is troubled because he is not living up to what he should be in Christ. The Christian is troubled about those types of things, but the Christian is not troubled about what's coming upon the earth. Because it's all in the hands of his heavenly Father. And what he said he was going to do, he's doing, and he will continue to do, and he is in him. And he can go through anything. And how does he do this? Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Notice what it says there. In Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, it gives us a beautiful mandate of living. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. You say, well, how can I rejoice when I'm going through a problem? He didn't say rejoice in the problem. He said rejoice in the Lord. So even in the problem, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the trial, you can, if you can't be happy about anything else, be happy that you know Him and He knows you. Even if there's nothing else to be happy about, you say, you don't know my life, you don't know how miserable things are, you don't know how horrible the situation I'm going through is, it doesn't matter. Rejoice that you know Him and you are known of Him. 
That's enough to give you joy through anything. And that's how you can rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation, verse 5, be known unto all men. That word moderation means self-control, your temperance. The Lord is at hand. Let people know that you will not partake in certain things because the Lord is at hand. Let people know that you will not loose yourself up to just do anything anybody else does because you are a child of the king and you're waiting for the king of kings to come and you're not going to involve yourself in anything that will defile you because you're a citizen of heaven. And then he says, be careful for nothing. That word careful means anxious. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what do we do? We put the cart before the horse and we say, I'm anxious about everything. And I pray for nothing. We get anxious about everything. In all things, in everything by prayer. I love A.W. Tozer, what he said when he was commenting on this verse. He said, in the church we do everything by board meeting. Everything by financial collection, everything by politics, everything by education, everything by human effort. But it doesn't say that. It says in everything by prayer. Because all those other things may be okay, some of them, but you, without bathing them in prayer, they will not function. They will not work. So don't be anxious about anything. And how can you do that? If you're constantly in prayer. If a worry, worrisome thought comes into your mind, just breathe it back to God and say, Lord, I'm worried about paying the bills this month, but now I know that Thou ownest the cattle upon a thousand hills, and all the silver and gold is Thine, and Thou hast never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread, Lord. So I want to be, have Thy righteousness, so I can be in that position, not so I can pay my bills, but so that I can have the joy of the Lord in this problem. Give it back to God. You know, when I do that, it just, the mind is just at perfect peace. What does it say? Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose what? Mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. And you notice what he says here? Prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. Now you notice prayer is the life of devotion. It's entering into that time with God. That's what prayer is. Supplication is asking from God, but it's only one part of prayer. And we make it the most important part, unfortunately. If we realize that it's not asking, it's basking in His presence, then we would not only know what to ask for, but when to ask for it, and when to be pleased with what we have. You notice the world is not happy with anything today. That's why they're whipping out iPhones one after the other. Where are we now? At 10, 11, 12? This one has a little bit of a clearer camera. Oh, I'm going to get that one. You notice? This one has a, a little bit of a better plan. Ah, I'm going to get that one. Why? Because we're not happy with what we already have. Right? Not happy with what we already have. So we've got to have the next one and the next one. We're never satisfied. And God says, look, if you spend time with me in prayer, your supplications will be more godly and more directed by my spirit than by your desires. You ask and receive not because you take it out on your own lusts. Right? And then the last one is the most important, with thanksgiving. Make your requests known unto God. In that atmosphere, make your requests known unto God. Thanking Him for what He's already given you, be appreciating what you already have, and then saying, Lord, I'm happy with what Thou hast given me. Thy will be done in my life. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. That is the covenant that He made with us. Now go back to Malachi. Covenant of life and of peace. That's what he wants. He is the prince of peace. He is the author of life. Therefore, what have we to fear? But he also says in chapter 2, verse 5, My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him, life and peace and the covenant, for the fear of wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. Because he took me seriously, because he revered me, because he trembled at my word, I gave him life and peace. To whom will the, will the Lord look? To whom will he have regard? To him that trembleth at his word. Takes the word of God very seriously and seeks to live according to it. And we don't do that anymore. 
the, the, the Bible is just another book. The Bible is just another book that we open. We're not thrilled to open the word of the living God. A rabbi was gathering with his students um, <laughs> in his teaching. And every night he would teach the Old Testament. And all of his greatest students would gather. And when the teacher would begin to speak and say, And God said, Reb Jushia, that was his name, the student, would leap up overwhelmed with desire and he would yell out, And God said, God said. And he'd spin around like a leaf in the wind and then faint, unconscious for the rest of the teaching. Every night it was the same thing. The other disciples would tease him, saying, Zushia, you're missing all the holy teaching. This teasing went on for days and days until finally the master said, Leave him alone. He's the only one who gets it. Think about that one for a moment. When we say, and God said, thus saith the Lord, that should thrill us. Amen. To such a point that now we're ready to receive what he has to say. But if that doesn't thrill us anymore and we've lost it. We just want to go for the teaching. We just want to learn. We just want to imbibe. No, it should thrill us to open the book. That's what the covenant was all about. And what was the whole purpose? Then comes instruction. You notice? Uh, in verse 6, the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. Why? Because the law of truth was in his mouth. Notice, not only for Levi, not only for the priest, but for the remnant. Turn to Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 13. The remnant of Israel show what? Not do iniquity, so they have victory. Nor speak what? Lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. They'll feed on what? On the Word of God, on the things of God. Therefore, they will not do iniquity nor speak lies. Their mouth will be a pure mouth. And oh, how we have to watch our mouths, beloved. Because so often we may be doing everything else right, but we sin with our tongues and it defiles the whole body. That's what James says. To watch what we say about others, we have to watch how we comport ourselves, how we talk to each other, with, with, with the law of kindness should be in our lips, like the Proverbs 31 woman, the, the, the law of goodness and, and the deceitful tongue should not be found in our mouths. We should not be out to manipulate one another so that we can control one another. We have to speak the truth and speak it in love. That's what God's remnant does. You notice in Revelation chapter 14, talking about the 144,000, And everybody wants to tell me what the 144,000 are. Is it literal? Is it symbolic? I don't care. I want to be a part of them. I don't want to waste my time with that argument. I want to be part of them. And if I'm going to be part of them, these are their characteristics. It says in verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. What does that mean? That means the father's character is in their, in their minds. They have his character. They're godly. Heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, the voice of great thunder. I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. No man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Why? Because they went through a very unique experience, but they came out sealed and faithful. These are they which were not defiled with women or corrupt churches, for they are virgins. In other words, they may have come out of corrupt churches, but they never went back in. They never left the remnant. They are virgins, they are pure, they follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. And where is the Lamb right now? He's in the most holy place, preparing a people for the day of the Lord. And they follow the Lamb wherever He went on the earth. They do what He does. They minister the way He ministered. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And notice verse 5, in their mouth was found what? No guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. Starts in the mouth. 
Once that becomes under control, then the rest of the body can follow. Because then we begin speaking words of holiness, words of kindness, words of faith, words of, words of goodness, and it transforms us because words have power. And so this covenant was given for instruction, instruction in righteousness through the word of God. And now notice verse 8 in Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Actually, we'll go to verse 7 first. For the priest's lips should what? Keep knowledge. What is knowledge? What is the most important part of knowledge? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's what it says. It's not only the beginning of wisdom, it's the beginning of knowledge too. The fear of the Lord is the principal part of knowledge. And they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And our ministers today, by God's grace, have to be men whose lips keep knowledge of the word of God, and people should seek the law at his mouth. Yes, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts, but God in one sense has called us all to be messengers of the Lord of hosts. So we all need to know these things for ourselves. Not just to seek it from somebody else who knows, but then when they teach us and instruct us in the good way, in the right way, we take it and then we teach others. That's what our pioneers used to do. Everybody knew their Bible. I remember the story about Uriah Smith when he went to talk to a, a Sunday keeper about the, about the Sabbath. And he went there to the house and, and he said, I'm going to come. And he says, oh, you people have it all wrong with the Seventh-day Sabbath. And Uriah Smith went and he sat at the table and, the man, and he says, do you have a Bible? And he says, no, I don't have a Bible. So Uriah said, here, take my Bible. And he says, turn to this chapter and verse. So he turned to it. And then he said, but... But uh, hasn't this been done away? And every objection that he had to every verse that Uriah Smith took him to, he would take him to a counter scripture that would answer his objection. That's how well he knew his Bible. And not only he knew his Bible, but all our people knew the Bible like that. See, it's not about somebody having esoteric knowledge higher than yours. And if you don't know what I know, uh, you have to come to me to get it because I'm special. That's Catholicism. That's what we're doing in our universities right now. People are saying, look, if you don't know the languages that I know, and if you don't know, have the information I have, you don't have the degree that I have, you can't understand your Bible, so don't even try it. That's Catholicism. You don't go and listen to somebody because of their degrees. You go and listen to them because of their walk with God first and foremost. If they don't have a walk with God, don't go listen to them. Because all you're going to get is empty information. Now notice verse 8. But ye are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. And that word literally means to stumble in the law. To fall in the law. <laughs> Why? Because you're looking at the law the wrong way. You're trying to keep it in your own righteousness. So you fall in it. Because you can't keep it. And then he asks, Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Why do we deal every man treacherously against his brother? If you really care, and that word treacherously means deceitfully, faithlessly, offensively. If you really care for your brother, you're going to want him to be in heaven just like you want to be in heaven. And everything you're going to do for him, say to him, relate to her, you're going to do it to draw them closer to Christ. You're not going to do it to compete with them. Sometimes we can be very unkind to each other. Sometimes we can be competitive with each other. Sometimes we can think that we're better than the other person. We may not actually say it to them, but our behavior speaks volumes. And we treat each other treacherously. Every man against his brother. And by doing that, we're desecrating, defiling, profaning the covenant. Because we're not demonstrating Christ. How do you expect to be neighbors in heaven if you can't even get along here on earth? Huh? What, you think we're all going to be living in 
walled out homes or something. And you're going to have a special neighborhood for these people and another special neighborhood for that people. And the two will never meet. Is that what you think? Or you're going to shake hands in heaven? It's not going to happen. If you've done something wrong to someone, go make it right today. If you've said something wrong to someone, go make it right today. Go apologize. Be the Christian. Say, I'm sorry that I said this to you. Let's pray together. Be the Christian, because or else we're not in the covenant. We're just fooling ourselves. We're coming here and we think, you know, we were somehow special because we're coming here and we're learning all these things. That's, if, if we don't get along with each other, properly, righteously, in a holy manner, we're just fooling ourselves, brother. There's no covenant. So that's what they were doing. They were dealing treacherously with one another. But the covenant, when, 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 when you're in the covenant and you know you're in the covenant through Christ and you know that covenant, uh, you've made that covenant with God and you're living the life of Christ, of joy and of peace, you can stand upon anything. You can stand up to anybody for the truth. So anyone who kneels before God can stand before anybody. Elijah said, the Lord before whom I stand. There's not going to be any more rain here until my word comes. Wow. He always was aware that he stood before God. And I want to tell you in closing the story of the covenanters, the Scottish covenanters. Back in the 1500s after the Reformation in Scotland and John Knox came a group of people who decided to make a national covenant with God. Their kings were unholy. They were unrighteous. Their kings were basically the heads of the church. And they believed that they were actually the heads of the church. And the covenanters came out and they said, no, 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 no. You're not the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. And I think that applies today too. Men are not the head of the church. Christ is the head of this church. And so they spoke out and they, 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 they stood up. Many of them were martyred. Many of them were killed for the truth of God. But they stood to the covenant. They said, I will stand to the covenant to the death. And when they were threatened, they didn't flinch. Andrew Melville when one of the king's cronies threatened him with hanging, responded this way to him. He, first of all, Morton, the crony, said, the country will never be in quietness till half a dozen of you be hanged or banished. In other words, you're the ones that are troubling Israel. Does that sound familiar by any chance? Not just with Elijah, but I'm talking about today. The people who speak truth are the troublemakers. I love Andrew Melville's response. Melville, looking him in the face with his piercing eyes, replied, Tush, man, threaten your courtiers after that matter. manner. It is the same to me whether I rot in the air or in the ground. The earth is the Lord's. My country is wherever goodness is. Let God be glorified. It will not be in your power to hang or exile His truth. You can hang me, but you can't hang His truth. And you know, my flesh will rot either in the ground if I die or on the way up to meet the Lord in the air. What a perspective. And he said it with such firmness and such conviction that the man could do nothing. He felt himself outdared and outdone by the courage and calmness of this humble servant of Christ. But why were these men able to stand up in those times? Because they lived it every day. They lived the covenant every day. Look at Samuel Rutherford, one of the great uh, Scottish covenanters who they put in prison. He lost everything. I mean, he, he lost his church. They, they had him. They, he couldn't go near his people to, to minister to them because he was preaching truth to them. He was full of love, a life of power, of heaven, of glory, and of God. And listen to this. These are some words that he wrote. He wrote letters from his prison. And these are some of the things he wrote in the prison. My one joy, next to the flower of my joy's Christ, was to preach my sweetest, sweetest master and the glory of his kingdom. I would beg lodging for God's sake in hell's hottest furnace that I might rub souls with Christ. Were my blackness and Christ's beauty carded through, an, through other, his beauty and holiness would eat up my filthiness. Christ's honeycombs drop honey and floods of consolation upon my soul my chains are gold. And every letter he would write, he would open it up with, from the Lord's palace 
he was in prison. What a perspective. What a perspective. And time would fail me to tell of John Welsh, who used to spend eight hours of prayer a day, and sometimes he'd get up in the middle of the night, wrap himself with his mantle, and his wife would come and say, what are you doing praying out here in the cold? He would say, shush woman, I have a thousand souls to care for, and I know not how it is with many of them. Time would fail to tell me of Alexander Pedden, another great covenanter, who when they were chasing him in the mountains, would pray to God, Lord, wrap thy mantle over us. And the clouds would come and they couldn't see them. Time would fail to tell me of fiery Ann Geddes, who when the Anglican priest came to her church and he opened the new prayer book that they were supposed to start reading from and it was tainted with popery and Catholicism, grabbed her bench and said, Villain, will you say mass at my church? And threw it at him. And they ran him out of the church. These people were serious. They weren't going to stand for it. Because they knew they were in a solemn covenant with God. So how is your covenant with God going? Are you keeping the covenant by His grace? Do you see the beauties of the covenant? The agreement that you have made with God? And how wonderful it is and it, how, how it ought to be the only thing that you concern yourself with. Keeping that agreement. Staying true to that agreement. No matter what else happens, I will stay true by the grace, the power, and the righteousness of Christ through the Holy Spirit. I will stay true to that covenant. You want to say that today? And you may not be a Christian here today, maybe, and you want to say, well, I want to make a covenant with God. I want to make an agreement. I want to come and live in Him. But whatever your situation today, you want to say, Lord, I want to keep that covenant that I've made. I want to walk in that atmosphere of life and peace and instruction, holiness and goodness and truth, so that I can glorify thy holy name. And in the end, the only thing I'll be able to say is glory to God in the highest. If you want to say that, let's kneel together. O oh, loving and heavenly and holy Father, we are so thankful for the covenant that Thou hast extended to us. It is a blood-bought covenant. It came at the price of the blood of Thine only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we come to Thee today because there have been times when we have walked away from the covenant or broken its stipulations. There have been times when we've been taking the covenant lightly and we've been taking our, a we, rather than making a covenant with holiness with Thee, O Lord, we have made a covenant with death and evil and unrighteousness. And so, Father, today draw us close and help us to realize that everything we have that has been given in this covenant, Thy Word, it's a blood-bought book. The spirit of prophecy is blood-bought. Were it not for the blood of Christ, we would not have these things. They were purchased at a serious cost. The righteousness that we can have of Christ is blood-bought. What we're doing right now on our knees in prayer, it's blood-bought. Without the blood of Jesus, we could not even speak with Thee, nor Thee with us. And so help us to realize and to be grateful for the covenant that Thou hast made with us. Thou hast condescended to reach out to us sinners and to make a covenant so that we can go from sinners to sons and daughters of the living God. And oh, Father, today, forgive us where we have not taken it seriously, where we have not been grateful for this covenant, thrilled to our very beings, and help us today to recommit our lives to Jesus Christ and to keep the covenant by thy grace and by thy strength, by thy power through faith, and the righteousness of Jesus. So that, O oh Lord, we can walk worthy to glorify thy name. And that anything that happens to us, Lord, will be to glorify thy name. Because we're walking with thee. O oh God, be with our dear people here today and give them the grace and the strength and the faith to be able to 
to walk in this covenant, to live in this covenant, to have the life and the peace and the joy, the righteousness and the strength and the courage and the power that this covenant gives to us through the precious blood of Jesus. We thank Thee and we praise Thee for what Thou art about to do in our lives because we know that Thou art faithful. We know that Thou art able. And we ask all these things in Jesus' mighty and holy and wonderful name.